there's no punchline to state violence. Yeah. Sometimes stuff is just bad. Pop culture is not innocent. It's coded with all kinds of politics. The white mainstream feels that, that a shift is happening. They're nervous. They're nervous. Yeah. I like my feminist sort of murder free. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mark Lamont Hill. I can help contribute to a conversation that will lead to an outcome that is freedom, justice, equality, and self-determination for everybody. I'm an academic, a writer, a journalist. My name is Fatima Bhutto, and I'm from Pakistan. I think some ideas are too dangerous to do, except in novel form. I'm the author of six books of fiction and non-fiction, and I always knew I wanted to be a writer. We have an opportunity. I remember seeing Mark's speech at the UN in defense of the Palestinian people, which got him fired from CNN shortly after. A free Palestine. I asked myself, what could I have in common with a member of the Bhutto family, a political dynasty in Pakistan? Her book, Runaways, is about Pakistan, but it's about much more than that. It's about the universal psychology of oppression. I read Mark's book, Nobody, about the injustices faced by African Americans, and I was struck by how much it resonated, because it spoke to me about my own country. So yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I, I think you could have done a lot of things. Why, why, why was writing the way? Writing always felt like the clearest way mm. to, to talk about issues that I cared about and to explore things that disturbed me. I think fiction is even more liberating in that sense, because if you were to tell people I've written a book about radicalism, right. they may not really want to read it or talk about it, but when you put it in fiction, um, you can bring all kinds of dangerous ideas to people without them really knowing that you've done that. Yeah. Why did you write? Same thing, I like dangerous yeah. ideas. Yeah. I, I love that frame, dangerous ideas, because there, there will be people who will see a brown body and a black body and hear danger and think that we're writing about yeah. how to destroy stuff. Yeah. yeah. And in some ways we are, but, but we're trying sure. to destroy oppressive systems, right. not people. Yes. And so for me, I thought as a writer, I had an opportunity to use my mind and my spirit and marshal a whole tradition mm -hmm. in the service of justice. But I find that when you come from the places we come from and you're talking about the things that we talk about, and there's a discomfort with dangerous ideas, do you get told a lot of the times to be positive? Oh, yes. Yes, I'm like, it, it, it's incredibly frustrating. Yeah. Not because I'm without hope or optimism, Yeah. but sometimes you just gotta bring bad news. You know, I'm telling a story at the beginning of, of Nobody about a boy, Mike Brown, who was left on the ground for four and a half hours after being killed by a police officer, after being stopped for jaywalking, yeah. for crossing in the wrong part of the street, his schooling was, was poor. 80% mm -hmm. of the people in the town have warrants mm -hmm. against them, not for murder or theft, usually for like jaywalking or yeah. parking tickets. When I look at the story, what it means to be young and vulnerable in America, and black or brown, Muslim, trans, mm -hmm. queer, you know, mm -hmm. what immigrant, what, what have you, it's sad. It's depressing. Yeah. And editors say, you know, this is great stuff, it's powerful, it's informative, but I want people to laugh at the end. Uh, I need a punchline. I'm like, there's no punchline to state violence. Yeah. Sometimes stuff is just bad. Yeah. And we have to wrestle with it and we have to sit with it instead of being titillated and stimulated and excited by it or, or made to believe that, that the world is gonna just be okay. Yeah. Sometimes you have to let people sit with this misery. Some would say, though, you are a fiction writer. Yeah. This could in any way you want. That's true. <laughs> It ends badly usually. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I've read, other, I've read your other work, and it often ends. It, it often, often ends badly. badly. The, the book is great, but the story. <laughs> but but the, but but yeah, yeah. I mean, you, you leave us in this place. Yeah, but that's life, don't you think, Mark? That life doesn't end in this tidy way where everything is sorted and there's conclusions and people have closure. And so I think when you're writing fiction, at least you you have plenty of moments that are of joy and of beauty and of love, but. 
sometimes the endings are as they are in life, painful. Yes. I love, though, that while the ending is painful, the journey there is not entirely yeah. so. And when I travel around the world, I see that. I see yeah. resistance yeah. and I see joy in the midst of pain. Your books do that. Your books do that. I, one of the things I loved about your book and your writing is reading about you in Ferguson, mm. protesting Mike Brown's death and having Palestinians tweet you how to deal with tear gas. Yeah, yeah. Will you tell us about that? Uh, we were there at midnight one night in Ferguson a few days after the, the killing of Mike Brown. Yeah. And then the next night, tear gas, tear, even before the curfew, tear gas, tear gas. And we started getting tweets, because the world was watching this. Yeah. And we started getting tweets from Ramola, and they were like, run toward the wind. You know, stand closer to the soldiers, because if you stand close to the soldiers, they won't tear gas you, because then they'd get tear gassed. Yeah. You know, wrap this shirt around your eyes as a kind of makeshift gas mask. And they, they had been protesting in the West Bank against what was happening in Gaza, because in the same moment that we were protesting in Ferguson, August 2014, yeah. there, was, there had been a 51-day war in Gaza in Ju July and August of that same year, 2014. Now we're not just crying from the tear gas, we're also crying because we're like, oh my God, Palestinians who are catching hell in the West Bank and in Gaza... Watching... Right! Yeah. And they're taking the time yeah. of all the things they could be doing. They're taking the time to tell us how to be safer. And we're building those bonds of solidarity. So there's joy in there. There's, yeah. there's joy in the midst of that pain and the backdrop of that. And I guess that connects to another piece of this for me, which is the question of activism. Yeah. Because you're not just writing. Yeah. I'm not just writing. We're yeah. also on the ground in a certain way. Yeah. Do you, do you identify as an activist? Some people don't like that term. I don't know. I don't really know what it's supposed to mean. I can only write about the things I really care about. I can only put my voice and my time to something that means something to me. Yeah. And I think those are uncomfortable issues. Those are issues of powerlessness, of mm -hmm. justice. But I don't know. I think writing, when done well, is activism. I do think there's a difference between writing in the house, writing in the ivory tower, and yeah. you know, and being, being on the front, being the, there. Yeah. You at know, the barricades. I mean, people who were literally killed for writing and for drawing. Yes. That that's a whole different world. So I don't I don't take writing off the table as a form of yeah. resistance. I think activism is its own thing, mm. and it's its own kind of freedom fight. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I wonder though is mm. what the respective value is of each. Mm. And, I, and, I, and my concern is that sometimes as academics, we kind of poo-poo what happens on the ground. Yeah. And sometimes people on the ground are like, oh, you're just in your tower writing. Yeah. What good is that? What good is it to write the runaways yeah. when there are real people, you know, yeah. feeling hell from American imperialism? Yeah. Do people ever make you feel guilty for writing? Sure, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I get asked all the time, why are you writing when you could be doing? Mm. And I think writing for me is a form of doing. I think exactly because of imperialism, is oppressing and silencing so many people, that is a valid form of fighting back, to write, yeah. to have different stories. And I think it means something for those of us who come from the global south, for those of us who are Asian or Muslim, to see our stories reflected in fiction, in film, and not only in the news. Right. You know? Right. And, and not also from an orientalist, orientalist lens. Yeah. Because we can watch Homeland. We shouldn't. <laughs> Fair point. We shouldn't, but we can, and it's there. But I don't want to watch that anymore. I'm tired of that. For me, pop culture is not innocent, and it's not entertaining. It's coded with all kinds of politics. And, and we go to it innocently. Yeah. Um, but of course, the people who are making and producing pop culture are not innocent. Exactly. And then when you watch that from a million miles away, that becomes your norm for who and what black people are. Yes. Or who and what Muslims are, live. or yeah. how they live, South Asians, etc. Exactly. I was born in 78, and I, I was growing up in the 80s and 90s. I was a complete professional wrestling nerd. I mean, the grand moment of wrestling, the kind of modernized moment of wrestling, was when Hulk Hogan becomes the champ. Yeah. By beating the Iron Sheik. He'd come down the alleys from Tehran, Iran, and, and he got his title by stealing it. Yeah. Right. And he allied with with the Russian wrestlers. And so Hulk Hogan comes down. Sergeant Slaughter is his homeboy. You That's know, so fitting, isn't right. it? Yeah. So he's this super jingoistic, imperialistic yeah. sort of figure yeah. who's defeating Russians and Iranians. Mm -hmm. And so we're justifying foreign policy by framing these people in a certain way. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm looking at all these Africans and Arabs and Iranians who are yeah. barbaric. I'm looking at these white American superheroes. Yes. So by the time I find out that we're going to, you know, enter the Persian Gulf or that we're going to... It, You're prepared. I'm prepared for it because yeah. it makes sense because they're just like those guys I watch every Saturday. Yeah. And, and I, I can't imagine yeah. how you feel. 
watching that stuff. I'm furious all the time, actually. The scene that always really, really upsets me is Zero Dark Thirty. Ooh, yeah. Where the CIA officer, and have you noticed how they're always really concerned, careful, thoughtful individuals in films? Yes. So whenever someone's <laughs> being tortured, there's always a CIA officer to be like, is he going to be OK? <laughs> and, so, and, so, and so there's a moment in Zero Dark Thirty, and this is like history according to Hollywood, where there's a man being waterboarded. And we know, right, that actually torture didn't yield any actionable intelligence. Right. But there's this man being tortured to within an inch of his life, and the camera is not really looking at him. It's looking at Jessica Chastain, the CIA officer, and she's like this. <sighs> the whole time. Right. You know, you're going to kill him. And she's like, I think I'm going to be sick, and she walks to a corner. Poor her. Poor her. And I think that's the gaze, and that's the gaze of power. Mm -hmm. And so pop culture identifies our solidarity with the powerful and never the powerless. And I think most people will watch that and think it's a great action film or this drama and suspense, but that's intense cruelty and that's intense dehumanization at play. Absolutely. And it's everywhere. Yeah. I mean, it's in the shows, it's in the TV, it's in sports, as you said. And I think that's why people like Muhammad Ali mm. are so moving and powerful because they fought against that. They brought some new form of politics and resistance and questioning and dissent to the field of entertainment and pop culture. Yeah. I mean, we have Colin Kaepernick in, yes, you in, do. in, the, yeah. in the States, you know, who, who took that knee and has essentially lost his career yeah. uh, because he's willing to stand up right. and fight state violence against black bodies. And there are more figures like that, I'm sure. You know, I just, and, and there's never been an overabundance of them. There've always been a, a, few, a few. few people who over time we begin to love and romanticize. Yeah. But in the moment we hate them, you know, yeah, people they forget. suffer. They suffer. They suffer extraordinary costs. And I think that we can never forget the cost. But you know, Mark, we, I mean, in South Asia, we're cricket playing countries, mm. in India and Pakistan. We had in February of 2019 tensions between these two countries, and they're nuclear armed nations. So when you have tensions between two nuclear armed nations, that's, I mean, p possible annihilation. And one of the things that was really disturbing to see is how entertainment figures and sports figures rallied for war. We have mm. athletes who are wearing military camouflage hats to play a game. A lot of Bollywood actors tweeting for war. Pretty horrific stuff, like cheerleading attacks, um, jingoistic statements. In the States, that's the norm, right? Yeah. Kaepernick is, is kneeling against the backdrop yeah. of Air Force and Army commercials, the entire sport, which is all about war. I'm in yeah. the trenches, I'm blitzing, I'm throwing yeah. long bombs. Um, and he's the outlier. Are there any outliers where you are? No. <laughs> no, it's all pretty, it's pretty depressing because we've wow. got a lot of ultra-hyper nationalism. And I think, I'm not sure it's ever been that bad. I guess that's why, again, your book for me is so necessary. Because when I hear the story of state repression, when I see American imperialism, when I see economic deprivation, and I see how one could become desperate and one could become radicalized. I mean, this was the argument against American imperialism from some of us here. Yeah. Was you're creating the very thing that you're afraid of. Yeah. How do you get to that place of thinking about radicalization? Well, I think that if we're looking at the 20 years of the war on terror, almost, it's been such a shallow narrative. And that narrative has been presented to us by, by the West, essentially. And what they've said is, there are these people, they're Muslims, they're vulnerable to radicalism. They're dangerous, they come from these places, and that's it. Mm. And they left themselves out of the frame. So there was no conversation about America's forever wars, yeah. about the thousands of, of civilians killed in these secret drone campaigns. Um, there was no conversation about inequality and poverty. And I think for a lot of us living outside the West, that was always false. It was always patently false. Yeah. And to me, the question of radicalism doesn't come from religion at all. But it's a question of anger, of powerlessness, of fear, of isolation. And if you have young people in society where they have no vision for their future, they have no vision for a dignified life, noble work, 
safety, then they're going to be vulnerable to any vision that is offered to them mm. and they'll take it. And so on that level, I think the world is, is not helping uh, end radicalism. It's only furthering it by cutting out space. Yeah. To me, I would argue that many of us in the United States have a radical vision. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't use the language of radicalization because of what it connotes. Sure. And it seems that when people in the global south want to have a radical imagination and a radical reimagining of the world, yeah. we think of violence, we think of destruction. And as you said, we don't think about the forces that get them there. Is there any, should we maybe throw it open a little bit to questions? Yeah. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in at this moment. How are we to get two sides that are unwilling to cooperate with one another? Hmm such as opposing states or even sectarian actors in the Middle East mm. to come together and begin focusing on their similarities and contribute to cooperation and more constructive dialogue? Mm. Whew. That's a good question. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> I knew she was going to do that. <laughs> I think it, it varies from context to context. Yeah. Um, it also... I'd have to, I'd, I'd probably push a little bit and ask who the we is in terms of who's the we that's doing the orchestration here. So in the case of uh, Israel-Palestine, we could pretend that this has been an enduring war that's gone on since the beginning of time, which is the kind of dishonest narrative. Or we could say this is a very material struggle over, over land and resources that could end tomorrow if the United States took a different position. Hmm. That's the kind of thing. So I'm thinking less about the kind of uh, politics of good relations and cordiality. And I'm thinking more about the way that we, particularly when it comes to the Middle East, mm. can radically reshape relations simply through our investments as, as dominant global power, global northern powers. There's a moral thing here, too, now. Um, the United States could not just say, hey, we're, we, we have control over Israel-Palestine, or, uh, uh, but to also say, we want a different outcome. We want an actual just, equal, fair outcome for everybody. That's, that's a different position to take. We could look in Yemen hmm. and say, wait a minute, we, what's happening here is unjust. And what the Saudi Arabian government is doing is unjust. And because we have an economic stake in Saudi Arabia and vice versa, we can exercise some power hmm. to prevent the humanitarian crisis, to prevent war crimes from happening. We, we can do that. We can do that right now. So it's, it's partly about exercising our interests, but it's also about saying, Let's have more humane mm. and compassionate interests. Mm. But that's not going to come from governments. Governments don't have feelings. They only have yeah. interests. But we as citizens have feelings. Mm. And we can shape our feelings and interests to converge with the interests of the state so that they can make different choices. But that means we have to vote. We have to organize. We have to resist. We have to fight. We have to tweet. We have to do all that stuff. Fatima, recently you've spoken about um, what you've called corporate and celebrity feminism. Mm -hmm. And Mark, in the past, you've challenged conventional views of masculinity. Mm. Tell us more about this. Today, the word feminism is used in a really weirdly broad way. So it's, it's given as an example of feminism the fact that out of five of America's largest defense companies, four of those are run by women. Now, um, you know, Northrop Grumman, which is one of the largest arms traders in the world, has a female CEO. And they make, they're the largest supplies of drones to the U.S. military. They make the B-2 bomber, mm -hmm. which can drop thermonuclear weapons. Why is this an example of feminism? Mm. You know, I, I like my feminists sort of murder-free. <laughs> and, and I think, you know, they, they say, that, you know, Gina Haspel is the director of the CIA. I'm supposed to feel good as a woman that you now have a woman in charge of waterboarding people. I don't feel good about that. And I think, you know, we, again, we have also these ideas of, of corporate feminism. Yeah, leaning in. Leaning in. And, you know, the philosophy of lean in is lean in. It only talks to women who are, you know, in the building, on that ladder, at the table, but it doesn't talk to people who are not on that path up. Yeah. Feminism has to be about justice. It has to be about in in inclusivity, about equanimity. It's not just about being a woman. And I always mention Audre Lorde, mm. um, who is a great intersectional feminist, who said you cannot dismantle the master's house using the master's tools. Right. And white corporate colonial feminism are the master's tools. 
Absolutely. And so many of our imperial interventions in the Middle East in particular. To help. Right. Yeah, to help. To help women. It was a Gatry Spivak who said it's about white men saving brown women from brown men. Yeah. And so we end up, oh my God, we have to go there and save the women. We have to go to Afghanistan. Look yeah. at what's happening. Yes. You know, Saudi Arabia, oh, close your eyes. We, we, yeah, we need yeah. oil. You know, Egypt, close your eyes. Don't yeah, worry about yeah, that. Yeah. You cool. Yeah. But, you know, so, so it becomes this really arbitrary invocation of feminist sensibilities. Yeah but only for certain kinds of women under certain kinds of circumstances. There you go, yeah. And so I don't want to live in a world where feminism means white women and or where it's neoliberal feminism, where it's That's the right to be. Yeah, really, really wealthy. <laughs> yes, yes, to have it all. And I think the other problem with this, which goes to the piece about masculinity and, and manhood, I think, is that we also have to reimagine what con counts as women's issues and men's issues in such a way that women have equal access, equal justice, um, and that we can look at the world, not just through the lens of men, men and male identity, but also through women. We have, to, we have to reimagine all this stuff, and too often we don't. And the reason I say that is because there's a hashtag going on uh, in the current moment that says men should not be deciding women's bodies. Men right. should not be making policy about women's bodies. Yeah. And I kind of agree with that. Yeah. But if you had a room full of women, yeah who were making the same bad choices, yeah, I also would be, wouldn't feel comfortable. Yeah. So I don't want patriarchy and drag. I, I want a whole new world. Yeah. yeah. Um, we've mentioned Colin Kaepernick. Um, now, Mark, you, in a way, kind of took your own knee for the Palestinian people. You, you lost your job at the CNN when you uh, made your speech at, at the UN, um, speaking for the Palestinian people. I wanted to ask both of you what um, advice you have for people speaking up for those who can't speak um, against all kinds of attempts to silence and smear those, those words. Yeah, have a good savings account. <laughs> um, I don't think we have the luxury of dividing our struggles. The same systems of patriarchy that oppress you mm -hmm. and that oppress me and more, especially women in our country, they don't stop at, they don't stop at the border. Yeah. They don't go through checkpoints. Mm -hmm. Capitalism isn't limited to a region. It's a global system. Patriarchy is a global system. Transphobia is a global system. And so, or at least ideology. And so we, we don't have the luxury of not standing up for each other. I, I don't think that I did anything special by standing up for Palestinian people. I did what was right. And so I encourage everyone to live at these intersections, to think internationally, to have a global critique of power and to operate in that fashion. Be wise, be, be selective. Every moment isn't the moment to lose your job. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. I didn't wake up that morning knowing I was gonna lose a job. I, I, I wish I could tell that grand of a story. Yeah. You know, maybe in the novel I'll write that. You know? <laughs> but in real life, I, I did what was right and I was open to the possibility that bad things could happen yeah. or unfortunate things could happen. But, but I think at the core, we have to be committed to that kind of intersectional work. Yeah, yeah. that's beautiful. I think also the idea that of, of giving voice to the voiceless is sort of problematic because no one is voiceless. Yes. Everyone has voices and and what you said is so beautiful because actually it's maybe just solidarity or being an ally or trying to do what we can to make sure other people have the voices we do. Yeah, that's the key. Yeah. They only want to protect life for nine months. Yeah. Okay. Once the baby's born, you're on your own. Then that's it, no yeah. housing, no health care, no food. I cannot be assured of justice when I go to the police because the police are a part of a deeply personal injustice in my life. His hands on his gun the whole time. I very much thought I was going to get shot. It looked like a bad movie. Saudi Arabia, close your eyes, we, we, yeah, we need yeah, oil. Yeah. You know, Egypt, close your eyes, don't worry yeah, about yeah. that. You cool. <laughs> yeah. Radicalism doesn't come from religion at all. It's a question of anger, powerlessness, of fear. I don't want patriarchy and drag. I, I want a whole new world. Yeah. You've written a lot about prisons in Nobody. You've spoken a lot about it. And when I was reading your book, I was so moved by those sections. And I was thinking very much also about my country, about Pakistan. And Pakistan has sentenced someone to death at the rate of one person a day Oof. for the last 15 years. The government, after a really brutal attack on a school, the army public school in Pakistan, where 
over 130 children were killed, just brought back the death penalty. There had yeah. been a kind of unofficial moratorium. And the people who were being executed when the moratorium was lifted, in fact, were not terrorists or serial killers. They were poor. They were illiterate. They were from minority communities. In our case, that would be, there were um, some Christian men who were put to death, you know, under things like the blasphemy laws. Mm. Um, there were people who had no power to protect themselves. And they were always the victims. And this is something from reading your work that I see not just in Pakistan, but in America too. Which, Absolutely. Which we, from outside, see as this sort of infinitely powerful place. Yeah, yeah. But our prison systems are not that different, are they? They're not. I mean, at, at the core, there is a retributive vision of justice. Yeah. That says that justice equals punishment. That's right. And punishment equals confinement. And extreme punishment equals death. Mm -hmm. And we see that too often in the world. The problem with what's happening in Pakistan, the problem with what's happening in the United States, in Saudi Arabia and other places, yeah. is one, the state doesn't have the moral authority to kill its citizens. Yeah. You know, one of the reasons in Germany they don't have the death penalty is because they said after our ugly, vicious history mm -hmm. of violence, of anti-Semitism, of ethnic cleansing, of destruction, yeah. of genocide, we don't have the moral authority to take life. To take life. Yeah. And Germany's right. Mm. But U.S. ain't got no clean track record either. But it's interesting that all this, all the people who are so viciously fighting abortion rights are really big proponents of the death penalty in America. Yeah, they only want to protect life yeah. for, for nine months. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Once the baby's born, you're on your own. Then that's it, No yeah. housing, no health care, no food, yeah. no school. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you're on your own. Yeah. Other thing is, does it work? Because the argument is that this will stop bad stuff from happening. If we just kill more people, yeah. we'll stop stuff from happening. Yeah. You would think that if you impose the death penalty, that crime would drop. It doesn't. It doesn't. Um, and then the other piece of it for me is we get it wrong too much. There are too many people who are wrongfully convicted, wrongfully charged on the basis of race, on the basis of class, on the basis of gender, on the basis of gender presentation, on the basis of sexual identity. So all that together for me is dangerous. And you have personal experiences with the reflexive racism of America's police. Mm, yeah. I was dropping a friend off after a night of, I wish I could say I had wild, crazy nights, but we were playing video games. Okay. Um, <laughs> they can edit that out. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> edit that out, people. Say how we were doing something fun, you know, yeah. something crazy, you know. Yeah. Um, but no, we, I dropped him home. Officer stops me. I asked him why. He said, I'm not telling you. He got me out of the car, slammed me into the car before, after asking me where my gun was. He didn't ask if I had a gun. He just asked where the gun was because yeah. apparently I just look like people, a person who carries a gun. Yeah. Um, I told him I didn't have one. His hand's on his gun the whole time, as yeah. is his partner. Um, I very much thought I was going to get shot because yeah. the whole it looked like a bad movie. Yeah. I, he, I, I've asked again, why am I being pulled over? He said, illegal discharge of a passenger. You would have thought he, I threw him out of the window, the way okay. the way the officer. Yeah. I, I, pull, I mean, I don't know any other way to discharge a passenger but to yeah. pull over, yeah. put the car in park, Say unlock the door. Yeah. I said bye. Yeah, yeah. Could have been a little nicer, maybe. He beat me in the game. Who knew? <laughs> so, but other than that, like there was nothing. Yeah. Um, they went through my trunk. They went through everything. Um, he was physically uh, abusive, yeah. slamming me back and forth into the car, and ultimately he didn't find anything but a checkbook that had doctor. Mark Lamont Hill on it. Mm. He, he said, he asked me why I had a checkbook that said doctor on it. <laughs> he said, where'd you get these? Mm. From the bank, I mean. Right, yeah. right I mean, you, yeah. I mean, no, this is, this is the ignorance of racism, right? Yeah. It was more plausible to him that I had robbed a doctor with the same name. <laughs> than that you were a doctor. <laughs> than that I could have a PhD, right? Yeah. <laughs> this is the absurdity of it. Yeah. So, at that point, he said, well, what do you do? I said, oh, I'm a, I'm a PhD, I'm a professor, and I'm also uh, a television yeah. personality. That's when the light goes off. Uh. Takes the handcuffs off, pulls me aside, puts his arm around me. Oh. Um, and says, you know, I'm going to do you a favor. Ooh. I'm going to let you go home. Oh. He said, but you're in the wrong neighborhood with that car. He said, I could lock you up for drunk driving, but I won't. Mind you, I hadn't had a drink. Hmm. But that was like a, a, a veiled threat, right? Sure. And he thought the night was over. Yeah. I, of course, sued. And, and it turned out he had a long history of violence. He had shot a few people. 
Yeah. Um, he had corruption. He actually ultimately was arrested himself as yeah. part of a drug and prostitution scam. But yeah. if I had not had the power and the resources and the visibility to challenge him, I would have been one of the many people who also had come forward and had been ignored. Yeah. Because in, in, in the city that I live in, and just like in Los Angeles and New York and many other places, the investigation of the police happens by whom? The police! The police yeah. Go figure. And they have a 98% clearance rate. Yeah. Unfortunately, there are no mechanisms of accountability. Hmm. I'm, I'm sure you, 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 you witness the same kind of stuff. In my case in particular, my father, who is a member of parliament, was killed outside our home by the police. And there were about 100 policemen there on the scene. Seven men were killed. And the police left them to bleed to death on the, on the streets. Great God. But the really tragic thing is that my case was not unique, hmm. in fact. At that period when my father was killed in the 90s in Pakistan, um, the police were engaged in what they called encounters. It just means extrajudicial killing. There were police officers who were encounter specialists who were known for their amazing ability to find criminals and, you know, accidentally shoot them in the back let's say. Wow. Um, and those policemen were never punished. They were never arrested. They were never demoted. In, in the case of my father's murder, the policemen were very senior and they are still employed today. Mm -hmm. um, and so that experience of police violence and not just the violence, but having no recourse, having no access to justice in the face of police is I think a very familiar one for a lot of people. In I would even say it's South Asia maybe, not just Pakistan. How do you engage that without feeling a profound sense of hopelessness? If I have a problem, Mark, I, I, I cannot be assured of justice when I go to the police because the police are a part of a deeply personal injustice in my life, I, I, as are the courts, as is the state. But I think that's an experience that in Pakistan is applied pretty widely. It doesn't matter if you're privileged um, if you have access to education or a voice, it doesn't matter. That violence is democratically employed against anyone who questions. Wow. Or who can question. Which I'm imagining can even further uh, contribute to radicalization. If you have no faith in the state. Well, we saw that with the Taliban, you know, why was the Taliban, in, in Pakistan at least, why were they able to move so quickly? Because the state was just absent. But these sort of movements were not. They were there on the ground. They lived in these neighborhoods. They knew what people needed. Um, we saw the same with education. So in Pakistan, we have a, um, a history of things called ghost schools, which means that governments will take millions and millions of dollars from Norway or Sweden or wherever to build girls' schools, let's say. And they will just pocket that money. And so you have a, a huge amount of illiteracy. But people will come in and set up, let's say, madrasas. And these are not just ordinary seminaries, but they teach kids how to read. So if you're a parent in a yeah. village in northern Pakistan, are you going to let your kid stay illiterate or are you going to send him to a madrasa? You'll send him to a madrasa. Yeah. So that's how, I mean, radicalism grows in a vacuum, I think, in a lot of places like Pakistan. Yeah. That makes it, or Egypt, I mean, we saw the Muslim Brotherhood in the 20s, Same forward, in Egypt, yeah. Hamas in, in, in more recent time. That public work and investment, whether it's orphanages, whether it's schools, et cetera, I think, again, the intuitive answer then, to me, mm. is if we wanted to stop radicalization, yeah. we could invest in the things that the vulnerable need. We could invest in schools and housing. We could invest in healthcare. We don't. And we could also bring people who live on the peripheries of our society into our society. Mm. So, I mean, in the case of France, which has suffered from radicalism, there's not a lot of conversation about the fact that a lot of people of, let's say, North African descent or Middle Eastern descent or Muslims are not included in the core of the city, of urban spaces, right. but relegated to these banlieues or the, the slums. And so they form this kind of outer ring of misery. You could bring them in. No, you could include them in life. And I don't think it happens. We have to figure out how to reimagine this relationship between margin and center yeah. and figure out how to make this shift. And I, I think in some ways, at least in the United States, the white mainstream feels that, that a shift is happening. They're anxious about. They're nervous. They're nervous. Yeah. 
you know, they're nervous that there's more brown people, there's gonna be a brown black yeah. majority. They're nervous yeah. about the refugee crisis, as they call it. For them, the yeah. crisis is that refugees are coming. That, isn't that amazing? <laughs> yeah. It's not that thousands of people have been dispossessed of their homes and their families. Right, it's that we have to deal with it. <laughs> um, I also find it really interesting how language is used by power, by power um, for racist means or, or, or other. And I know you've said that racism is when you define someone else's reality for them. Yes, yes, yes. But make it think it's their own. That's exactly right. And so we, we buy into these norms, even the, even the framework of being a minority. Right. Is, is itself a, a way of isolating and separating and dividing. I grew up in, in school and we were taught uh, that our history largely began with slavery. If you're told that slaves are brought to America, then your central identity is that of the slave. Mm. Whereas if you're told that people were brought to America and enslaved, now you want to imagine what their lives were like before they, it was interrupted by slavery. Yeah. Language shapes how we understand ourselves, how we, how we shape it. The, the idea of who's a rebel, the idea of who's a, I mean, when you hear Houthi rebel mm. in the West, you think, oh my God, those Houthi rebels, if they would just stop being yeah. rebellious, rebellious yeah. the world would be fine until you find out the Houthis ain't the problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's, it's, it's how you frame it. Who gets to be the rebel? Who gets to be the radical? Who gets to be the freedom fighter? Yeah. yeah. So can I tell you, this is something that annoys me to the extreme, right? Is this language that's defined by the Western white world. So mm. the thing I really don't like is people of color because we're brown people, we're black people, we're Asian people, we're indigenous people, we're Aboriginal people, we're Latinx people. Yeah. Why are all of us people of color and they're just one color? They're just white. They're just white, that's <laughs> what I say. Right. Shouldn't they be people of no color? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but And that's the... Uh, yeah, Seriously, I, I'm here for that. I vote for that. That's my you vote. Would, yeah. You have my vote. And and I find it, it also says that like I as a as a brown person have the same experience as an Asian person, or that an African American person will have the same experience as a Hispanic. I mean, it's not true. You know, so so I think it's I think it's both and though. On the one hand, we're all very different. Right. But there's a way that that strategic alliance is critical um, in understanding how to resist mm -hmm. imperialism. Mm -hmm. So I think there are moments where we have to identify our difference and our sameness. So I'm not against people of color yeah. at certain moments when we're fighting white supremacy. Sure, but it's still their language, right? It's still, yeah. it's their definition. Mm -hmm. So if there was another way to envisage a kind of community between us or a solidarity between us that was our own language, yeah. that would be preferable, wouldn't it? And that kind of takes us full circle. That's why we write. There we go. So we can write new possibilities. You're welcome, everybody. <laughs> Good night. Let's <laughs> yeah. so take some questions. I actually wanted to go back to the death penalty. Mm. Sorry. Um, the case of Asiya Bibi, the Christian woman who was yeah. acquitted yeah. for blasphemy and didn't, in the end, uh, get the death penalty yeah. and was uh, allowed to leave Pakistan in May 2019. Mm -hmm. Do you think that is a change for Pakistan and a positive change? The real change would be if we were not still subjected to British colonial laws or laws put in by dictators because General Zia who is is a CIA-backed dictator, amended the blasphemy law as envisaged by the English. But I don't see that change yet. I think in Asya Bibi's case, when the courts decreed that she should be freed, she should have been freed. And she was continually kept in solitary confinement. And then they let her out under cover of night. The change would have been if the moment the courts gave their verdict, she was let go. Mm. And I didn't see that. So I think we have a long way to go on that, unfortunately. Back to the carceral state. Um, would you agree that unless there is a significant and structural change, which seems unlikely in the current political configuration in the US and Europe, any kind of progressive partial changes like uh, decarceration of low-level drug offenders would be just kind of hiding the actual reality, which is a carceral state, which is brutalizing black Americans, but also other marginalized communities across across the globe. So, yeah. yeah. At the crux of it, I think, is a question of whether we can engage in reform of, of prisons um, in a way that doesn't undermine the actual goal of complete abolition of prison. Um, and it's something we struggle with. You know, I came up in the prison abolition movement and we had to really wrestle with some tough philosophical questions. We believed that reform normalizes the prison. It makes you think the prisons are reformable. Yeah. But these are real people in there. 
So when you say, oh, no, we don't need counselors. Oh, no, we don't need health care. Oh, no, not that prison library. We don't want to add too many education programs, because if we do that, then people will think the prison can be fixed. But there's somebody in there right now who could use a counselor or who could use drug treatment or who could use a condom to prevent HIV AIDS. There are things that we could do right now to help. And so there's always this tightrope of how to do real radical change, but not become so academic and abstract that you lose sight of the fact that people are suffering on the ground. And the other thing I think is I don't necessarily concede that the very idea of carcerality can't be unhinged from our consciousness. I believe that there are moves that are happening not under the name of abolition, but under the spirit of abolition that are doing just that. And I'll give you an example. We had the most intense and draconian drug laws anywhere in the world. The war on drugs begins in the 60s and 70s. By the time you get to the 80s, when crack emerges in America, we're, we're doubling down on it. Reagan's doubling down on it. They're saying, just, just say no. Hmm. But if you say yes, you're going to jail for a really long time. And if you say yes, if you say yes and you're black and you're brown mm. and you're poor mm. and you're doing crack rather than powder cocaine, then the punishment will be tenfold. Now white people are getting addicted. Yeah. Opioid addictions. Mm. And suddenly our moral compass is shifting. It's no longer pointing to the prison, it's pointing to rehab. Mm. It, it's pointing to medical treatment. Mm. We're not looking to the prison to solve the problem. Mm. We're saying, wait, there's another way to solve this problem. There's a social contradiction here. We got people who are addicted. We don't want them to be. Mm. How can we fix it? Right? President Obama, at the federal level, got rid of cash bail. And now Trump is, you know, mm. he got the party started again. But there's an idea here that says, wait a minute, maybe there's something fundamentally wrong with putting people in jail simply because they don't have enough money not to be in jail. Those ideas can, to some extent, along with getting rid of privatized prisons at the federal level, which Obama also did. These types of moves, they're reforms, but they also get at the radical change that we want to see. So I say, well, let's find ways at the intersection first so that the public mm. begins to say, wait a minute, maybe, the pri maybe when somebody steals my TV, the answer isn't to put them in a cage. Mm. Maybe when somebody's on crack, the answer isn't to put them in a cage. And if we can begin to look to those types of examples, I think we actually do get rid of the carceral logic itself. I just wanted to ask you, like, is there real hope for global activism under a capitalist, imperialist world where nobody cares about what's happening now in the Middle East because the Arab Spring is gone and the high point is, is over and, and what's happening now goes? Is also real hope for Palestine still available or, uh, or we're being too optimistic? I think now more than ever there's space for hope for all these things. It doesn't mean that it's being practiced in any way that we can get behind. You're being here, you're asking that question. I'm heartened by that. Yeah. And I don't think we have to operate in a global capitalist neoliberal framework. There's so much space outside it. Yeah. And there's so much movement and activism happening outside that sphere. Isn't yeah. there? I think so. I think that's where the radical imagination comes in. Yeah. We have to imagine new possibilities um, that are outside of those frameworks. The evidence is against us, sure. I was in Tahrir uh, last year, in Tahrir Square in, in, in Egypt, and I'm, I'm sitting there, and I'm like, wow, so much awesome stuff was happening here just a while back, and now the journalists are locked up. Mm. You know, it has uh, Abdel Fattah Hassisi, has he destroyed and been successful at, at quelling the revolution? Mm. Mm. You could be depressed. You could, you could stand in Jerusalem right now and say, oh my God, the embassy. Mm. Oh my God, Trump, Netanyahu, another term. Mm. And you could be depressed. Hope for me isn't about the belief that everything is just going to be okay. Mm. Hope is about the belief that despite the extraordinary odds that are against us, mm. and the odds are against us, us meaning those of us who believe in justice, mm. that despite those odds, we can still fight, we can still resist. We might not make any, any headway going this way, but we can stop it from going that way a little bit faster. And that will save a life. That will, that will feed a child. Mm -hmm. That will stop a war. That will put a spotlight on misery. There are things we can do at every moment to resist. Can that happen within a capitalist framework? No. Mm -hmm. That's me speaking, no. But that's my point. Radical hope doesn't pretend mm -hmm. that everything's just gonna be okay. It's, it's like your novels. Mm -hmm. you, don't, you, you don't let us off the hook. Hmm. You don't let us think that we can spend our way to freedom, that we can vote our way to freedom, yeah. that we can two-state solution our way to freedom. Yeah. Right? 
you're daring us to imagine something else. What about time? I think also we always leave time out. I mm. think we want hope today and we want change tomorrow. You know, I remember after the war on terror when Pakistan was a central part of fighting that war, they used it as a cover to do their own dirty wars within the country. And we started to hear about disappearances. And the state would say, oh, no, 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 that's war on terror. That's nothing to do with our own struggles. Mm. But, but the families of the disappeared would stand on the road outside the courts in the capital. One man with a picture of his father who hasn't come home. And that man was alone for a long time. He was alone for years. Mm. And then there were more people, and then there were more people. And today there's an entire political movement happening in the northern part of the country. It's called the PTM movement. And it's a movement of largely young Pashtuns. There are thousands and thousands of them, and they're moving all over the country. But I think if you were looking at that scene in 2006, it would have felt pretty hopeless. Uh, and you would not have been able to imagine the possibility of that to grow. And it has grown. So I guess patience has to be, which doesn't mean giving up or surrendering anything, but enduring. I think. Right. It's interesting because I think patience, sure, I think you're 100% right. Or endurance, maybe patience. I think is the endurance wrong word. is more right. Patience is the wrong word. I, I think yeah. about in, in, in Palestine this idea of sumud, of steadfastness. Yeah. I feel like there's something different about it. It's like in the same way there's, there's a distinction between hope and optimism. One is sort of naive. Mm. Patience is just like, just wait this thing out. The occupier will leave. Yeah. It ain't going nowhere. No, no. So not patience. Right. Endurance. Yeah. But there's something about being able to say that I'm going to remain here and resist. Yeah. Until. He until. Yeah. Right? Like, you, 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 you have revolution until the victory. It's a process. It's time. Yeah. Black folk in the West, we say the victory is in the struggle. That's it. Yeah. It's exactly. Interesting connection. Yeah. That's it. I want to ask one question. Where did you learn Arabic? Oh. Um, when did you stop? There was a sleeper cell in... Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> He's joking. <laughs> totally kidding, guys. <laughs> A little bit in school, and mostly just that self being self-taught. Yeah, okay. But it came from Malcolm X. It all starts with Malcolm X. I love me. Malcolm. I was a teenager, and I, I read it, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah. And um, I ain't been the same since. I read it as a teenager, but I read it again in college, and it helped me be free of a lot of anger. Mm. And I've never been the same since either. I had never considered that it was possible to read my way into a new sense of self. Yeah. But the thing about Malcolm that, that I most admire is his sincerity. Yes. Malcolm didn't have the world right all the time, but he always wanted to. Yeah. And he always was open to the possibility that he was wrong. And also the journey. He had a deep faith and surrender to the process. Yeah. That's hard. That is hard. Especially in this era where you, you got to be right all the time. Oh, but to have a voice like Malcolm's yeah. at this time. Can you imagine? So we got to create some new ones. Inshallah. Inshallah. When they tell you you're going to talk for like an hour I know, or it two, it, but <laughs> it's been so much fun talking to Thank you. Thank you, oh. Mark, for being here, for writing this beautiful book and for everything you say and do. And the same for you. Thank you for being a marvelous writer and a courageous voice in such dangerous and troubling times. Thank you all, too. Thank you. Sometimes we write as, I think we're really closet masochists. <laughs> Our entire relationship with the past is full of ruptures. One of my guiding mantras mm -hmm. is let nations die, that humanity may survive. Mm -hmm.